we are looking at Leviticus chapter 9. And um, we're going to get into the, 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 what we would call the everyday-ish, the nuts and bolts things. You know, you wake up and you got things to, to accomplish. It's, it's now time to get things done. All right? Um, you know, when you go to school and you study and you don't went through, you know, grade school and kindergarten and, and, and high school and, and some go on to college. And then, but then after a while, it's time to do what? Get a job and start going to work, punching the clock, doing what you got to do, making your living. All right. And um, so what we're seeing now here is the instructions have been given to God, given by God to Moses and to Aaron and to the children of Israel in their endeavor through the wilderness here as they are beginning to make their march through the wilderness. But there's always that kind of first day when it's time to, all right, let's start doing the work. You know, we got we to gotta, we gotta put the work in here now, right? And so now we're seeing uh, this start. The actual work is about to happen. All right? So let's take a listen <clears throat> to uh, Leviticus chapter 9. And then we'll come back and we'll, we'll discuss this actual work that they're doing here. Let's take a listen. Chapter 9. And it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. And he said unto Aaron, Take thee a young calf for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering, without blemish, and offer them before the Lord. And unto the children of Israel thou shalt speak, saying, Take ye a kid of the goats for a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both of the first year, without blemish, for a burnt offering. Also a bullock and a ram for peace offerings, to sacrifice before the Lord, and a meat offering mingled with oil. For today the Lord will appear unto you. And they brought that which Moses commanded before the tabernacle of the congregation. And all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded that ye should do. And the glory of the Lord shall appear unto you. And Moses said unto Aaron, Go unto the altar and offer thy sin offering and thy burnt offering. And make an atonement for thyself and for the people. And offer the offering of the people. And make an atonement for them as the Lord commanded. Aaron therefore went unto the altar, and slew the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. And the sons of Aaron brought the blood unto him, and he dipped his finger in the blood, and put it upon the horns of the altar, and poured out the blood at the bottom of the altar. The fat, and the kidneys, and the coal above the liver of the sin offering, he burnt upon the altar, as the Lord commanded Moses. And the flesh, and the hide, he burnt with fire without the camp. And he slew the burnt offering. And Aaron's sons presented unto him the blood, which he sprinkled round about upon the altar. And they presented the burnt offering unto him, with the pieces thereof, and the head, and he burnt them upon the altar. And he did wash the inwards and the legs, and burnt them upon the burnt offering on the altar. And he brought the people's offering, and took the goat, which was the sin offering for the people, and slew it, and offered it for sin as the first. And he brought the burnt offering, and offered it according to the manner. And he brought the meat offering, and took an handful thereof, and burnt it upon the altar, beside the burnt sacrifice of the morning. He slew also the bullock and the ram for a sacrifice of peace offerings, which was for the people. And Aaron's sons presented unto him the blood, which he sprinkled upon the altar round about, and the fat of the bullock, and of the ram, the rump, and that which covereth the inwards, and the kidneys, and the caul above the liver, and they put the fat upon the breasts, and he burnt the fat upon the altar. And the breasts and the right shoulder Aaron waved for a wave offering before the Lord, as Moses commanded. And Aaron lifted up his hand toward the people, and blessed them, and came down from offering of the sin offering, and the burnt offering, and peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation, and came out, and blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And there came a fire out from before the Lord, and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fire, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. All right, so here we go. Chapter 9. This is what I would call the let's get it done chapter. Um, we, we actually now are in a point where we actually got to do what it is 
that the Lord has instructed us. We've gone through the school. We've gone through the instruction. We're going, we, we, we've gotten the lesson in. Now we've got to actually start performing the task. Okay? Um, you can go to school. And, you know, you, you can... Um, and a lot of times I use school, but there's a lot of learning that you do. Um, you learn how to, you watch your parents when you were younger, make pancakes and bacon and eggs and, you know, make, you know, cook corn and, and collard greens and all that different good food, right? But there come a time when, all right, now you got to start making it for yourself, right? Because you're going to need to be able to eat every day, you know, the, the, you know for your nourishment and for your build up. You got to learn how to feed yourself, all right? And so that's an important aspect of life. A lot of things that we have to learn to do, and then we begin to operate in that, and that produces our everyday activity, which allows us to go from one day to the next. So let's take a look here, chapter nine. And it came to pass. I mean, it's right, that came, and now it's here. Right? We were looking for that day, and it's here. <laughs> okay. All right, so it came to pass. You know, one of the things we can think about is like um, one day they're going to tell us, okay, nobody has to wear masks anymore. Today's not that day, but that day may come to pass. One day they may tell us that, you know, we can kind of go back to doing things like we used to do in a, in a similar way. That day hasn't happened yet. Okay? Um, things will get to where they need to get to. A lot of times we think, well, it's far away. It's like, we look right now, it's, it's what? It's April. And somebody says, well, you know, Christmas is coming. Man, Christmas is far away. Christmas will come, and it will come to pass. It will come, and it will move right on by. So you always got to keep in mind that in the world and the reality that we're living in now, time moves, and development happens, and growth takes place. And you should experience and expect it and allow it to happen. <clears throat> Parents got to let children grow up. You know, um, you got to allow them to mature and to go and, and give them extra opportunity to, to mature and, and respond. All that stuff comes to pass. And it's important that we recognize it. So look at this. It said it came to pass on the eighth day. Stop there. That's significant. The eighth day. What other thing happens on the eighth day according to the, mo the law of Moses? Well, when a child is conceived and is, is nurtured in the, in the womb for nine months and then is born, after it's born, on the eighth day, what happens? You, circumcise. you circumcise it. You remove the flesh from around the foreskin. Uh, 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 and, and that is the covenant between God and the, and the Israelite uh, people. And so that means that now you have been uh, uh, consecrated to the Lord, symbolizing by removing the foreskin or the flesh. And it's, it's a symbol of taking away. So the eighth day, once again, represents you're, you're now preparing to enter into the presence of God. Why? Because you have removed the flesh and have moved forward the spirit. Okay? Symbolizes that. But look at this. It says that it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel, calling all those people that have responsible leadership. Right? And he said unto Aaron, take ye, take thee a young calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering without blemish and offer them before the Lord. Okay? So he's giving him instructions. These burnt offers. We've been through these already. So what is he looking at? Two of them right here. A sin offering and a burnt offering. And remember we said before that a lot of times these offerings, even though they were they're given to us by in description individually, their, <clears throat> their actual use is uh, a lot of times going to be combined based upon what it is that they're doing. So oftentimes, you won't just be offering one offering. You'll be offering multitudes. And I look at this, I say, you know, you say, well, how, you know, why is that? And I go, well, number one, I don't know why. God knows. But I will say it's similar to how we do when we take on what we need to take on for our 
everyday nourishment, our personal everyday sacrifice, which is food. We have some food, we can get some vegetables, we get some starch, right? And then sometimes if we feel like it, we might want to get something that's got a little sugar to it, a little sweetness to it. We call that what? Dessert. And that's the kind of stuff that, that we do on a regular basis. And we don't just say, well, I'm going to eat meat today and vegetables today and the next day I'm going to eat this. No, we kind of mingle it all together. Same thing with these offerings. They get kind of mingled together to form a, 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 an activity to bring forth a task. Okay? So he says, I want you to, to offer up these sin offerings and this burnt offering. They should be without blemish. These offerings are unto the Lord. Verse 3. And unto the children of Israel thou shalt, thou shalt speak, saying, Take ye a kid of the goat for a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both of the first year, without blemish, for a burnt offering. Now, I always kind of chuckle when I read this, because he says when he goes to the children of Israel, he, I want you to, to go get, uh, you're going to offer up a, a sin offering, uh, but you're not going to just offer up anything. You're going to offer up a goat. And I always kind of chuckle because we know the nature and the mindset of a goat. Goats are always kind of like stubborn and bucking back and fighting against it and all that. And that nature we're going to see throughout this travel that the children of Israel are going to be, be goat-like in their attitude. So I just find that a, a, a very interesting correlate. Cor uh, uh, when it comes down to the type of sin offering that they're offering, they say get a goat, and then you get a lamb, you get a calf and a lamb, both of the first year, without blemish for a burnt offering. So you're going to do a calf and a lamb for the burnt offering, for the people. Okay. So right now we don't we don't we got four offerings going on. We got uh, uh, actually five offerings. We got two offerings going on for Aaron, and then we got. Uh, uh, three offers going on for the for the people. Look at four. Also, a bullock of ram for a peace offering to sacrifice before the Lord, and a meat offering. Oh, there they go. Look, we got and we remember the meat offering is what actually mm -hmm. the meal offering, the grain offering, right? It's not really meat. It's just a so so called a meal offering, and me, uh, the meat offering mingled with oil. We talked about how the oil represents. So we're bringing all this in together. Mingle with oil, for today the Lord will appear unto you. Oh, I get it. So we're doing all of this activity. We're doing all, and God now is going to appear. God's been speaking and dealing and working with Moses and with, and with Aaron and, and, and those that are in, in the leadership aspect. But what the Lord is saying now, I want you to go and all the stuff that we've been instructing. God's been talking to me and I've been telling you. He's been showing me this and I've been telling you what he's saying. But now, I want you now to start doing the thing so that you can hear God for your what? Yourself. Which is what we all should be striving to do. When you talk to anybody, the whole the whole aspect of what you're trying to do is not so that they can listen to you. Now, you want them to pay attention to you, but your goal is for them to uh, ultimately listen to who? Yeah. Listen to God. We're pointing everybody to the Lord. If you can begin to build relationship with God yourself and you begin to talk and deal with him yourself, you're going to watch yourself grow and just be full of the of the joy and the peace that passes all understanding. God can only give that. I can't give it to you. You can't give it to me. But God can give it to you. And God can give it to me. But that's an important piece. So th this portion here, this fourth verse here, where it says the reason why we're going to do all this is for what? For God is going to appear unto us. So now, when we read this, this is still what? Instruction. All right? So now, when you get direct instructions, what do you got to do? You got to begin. You got to do it. So let's look at the rest of this chapter. Let's see what happens after this instruction was given. We they were told what to do, and they were told why to do it. Bring these offerings because God wants to show Himself to you 
All right, look at verse 5. And they brought, okay, what does that mean? That means they actually began to go and what? Bring what needed to be brought. They didn't think about it. They didn't say, well, I wish I could go get it. They didn't say, well, I'm sitting down, but I'm kind of tired. Right now, and I'm relaxing. No, they brought that which Moses commanded before the tabernacle and, uh, of the congregation. And all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. So they went out and got all those animals and all that stuff for the meal offering and the meat offering, and they brought all that stuff. So basically, you can almost say they went grocery shopping. Right. They went down to Walmart. Well, they didn't have Walmart, but you know what I mean. They went down there, they got all the stuff they needed, and they did what? They brought it unto the Lord. And sometimes that's an important piece that we often forget. We have it in our mind, but we're not bringing anything. So you can think all day long about how good some cornbread would taste, but you got to go do what? You got to go buy some. It actually has to happen. Now, you say, well, that's very simplistic and obvious, Wayne. Yes, it is obvious, but you'd be surprised how many people have what they want to do for the Lord in their mind, but they don't actually bring it to God. I don't do it. I want to give my problems to the Lord. But you don't give it to him. You don't bring them. I want to trust God for and give him, you know, my joy and, my, and allow him to give me my joy and my peace. But you don't do it. You think about it. You want it to happen, but you're not doing it. You have to bring it to the Lord. Cast your cares on me for I what? I care for you. So a lot of people have these cares. And we want, oh, I want God to do this. Well, why don't you just bring it to him? So that aspect of they brought that which Moses commanded. Are you bringing to the Lord that which the word of God commands? Exactly. So we don't bring the ram. We're not bringing the goat. But we need to bring our fears. We need to bring our worries. We need to bring our frustrations. Right? We need to bring our anxieties. We need to bring our, our, our envies and our jealousies and, and all of that stuff. We need to bring it to who? Bring it to the Lord. Right. And that's an important aspect. Yet we, we, we'll we read about it all day long. We'll, we'll study about it, but we won't bring it. And that's why I had that word, a little war, word <clears throat> highlighted. Uh, it says, and they brought. And I got that word highlighted. And it's important because that's the action word. You got to actually do it. It's not good enough to know. You also have to what? Do Let's keep going. Verse 6. And Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commanded. Okay? This is what God Moses is like, I didn't, I didn't do this. This is not me. The Lord commanded this. That ye shall that ye shall do oh, so you're bringing it and you're going to do what? You're going to do. So bring and do. Two very simple words. But it's important that we do it. Okay? And then it goes, And the glory of the Lord shall appear unto you. Wow. So, now Moses is saying, If you bring this stuff, which they did, they brought it. Now, if you continue and you do, the glory of the Lord will appear unto you. So, you'd be surprised when you start put, giving your anxiety how the glory of the Lord will shine through you. Wayne was testifying about that today earlier before we got started how he's like you know I, I've been just thinking about things a little different and what does that mean he's giving stuff to God that he normally trying to man maneuver himself and so when we learn to do that that peace and joy that God promised will begin to arise in us but we are so <laughs> sometimes just stubborn to feel like Okay, 
I can handle this myself. Stiff neck people. We get stiff neck. You know, and we get to the point where we feel like there's some things I want to be able to handle myself. You know, it's like that old that old worker back in the back in the uh, uh, 1930s. You know, he's working in the um, uh, in, in, the, in the north, moving up from the south, and he's the only black man working in the factory, and they don't like him, and they come in there and they're talking about him and they're teasing him. And they're calling them all kinds of names. And he goes home every day and says, Lord, I'm giving them to you. He goes back to work the next day and they laugh at him. They steal his lunch. They mess with his tools. And he says, Lord, I'm giving them to you. He goes back the next day and they act up, push him and spit in his face. And he says, Lord, this one I will take care of myself. <laughs> now, you know what he's about to do, right? And so, but the, 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 the little story of, of that is how there's certain points where I'm going to take care of this guy myself. When it, really we should be what? I'm going to give everything to the Lord. But what are we? Human beings. And so when we hear that story about that guy that's given to the Lord until the guy spits in his face, and he's like, okay, no, this one I'm going to take care of myself. We can identify with that guy. But it still don't make it right. We still should give all of what we can, all of our concerns to the Lord until the Lord tells us what to do. Like he said, so when the Lord tells us now, when you get there, do this or say this, those are the things that um, we should keep in mind. And the scripture tells us, tells us to love our enemy. It's not always easy to do. Pray for them to despitefully use you. It's not always easy to do. Help the poor, the down, downtrodden, those that have uh, less than you. Not always something that you want to do, but you should set your mind to do what God told us to do and watch God work when we do it. All right? So it's important. All right, let's move along. I spend a lot of time on that, but I think it's important. All right, so the Lord will appear unto you. Verse 7, And Moses said unto Aaron, Go unto the altar and offer uh, thy sin offering and thy burnt offering and make atonement for thyself. So first thing that Aaron's got to do, he's going down and he's going to offer up a, an offering because he's getting ready to, to serve people, but he's got to offer, make an offering for what? Himself. All right. Every day we got to get up and we got to ask God to work on who? Work on me. Work on me, Lord. Okay? Except so for thyself and for the people. So you also are trying to say, so Lord, work on me, but I want you also to allow me to be a what? A light to the people. Help me to say something or do something or be something that will encourage somebody else. Help somebody else. And, and you'd be surprised what your gift has been able to do to help and bless other people. Keep going here. It says, and offer the offering of the, uh, the people and make an atonement for them as the Lord commanded. So he said, now go and do this. Offer this up. Look at verse 8. And Aaron therefore went. And I got the word went highlighted. Very simple word, but I got it highlighted. Because he didn't just hear, he went unto the altar, and then he slew the calf. The calf. What does slew mean? That means he's actually doing what he said. You got to take that 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 uh, that animal that is without blemish, and you have to kill it. You got to cut its throat. Because you know when you look at the word slew here, we just look at it, we could read right past it. But what that means is that we now are allowing sin's wages to be uh, passed through. The wages of sin is what? Death. Death. All right. So right there, that's that's one pay that's one paycheck right there. And slew the calf for a sin offering, which was for himself. All right. So it symbolizes it's ceremonially. Uh, uh, and it's it's temporary, all right, because the ultimate 
and eternal payment of sin was done by who? By Jesus. Jesus. But they're doing symbolic and ceremonial payments here. It's like promissory notes that you're going to have to actually pay for, uh, accumulate and actually cash in at some point in time. Verse 9. And the sons of Aaron brought the blood unto him. All right? You have blood because you did what? You, you killed and you drained the blood. All right? See, when you, so when you see blood, you know that you're dealing with something that had what? Died. Right. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Okay. <clears throat> Brought the blood unto him and dipped his finger into the blood. All right. Now we look at that today. We go, ooh, that don't sound too too kosher. That don't sound too sanitary. But what is he doing here? He's identifying that blood that it, it, it came from that animal that is now dead is actually what is owed to me. I should have died because I have sinned. All right. He dipped his finger into in the blood and put it upon the horns of the altar. I take that death and I put it upon the strength of God. That's what the horns of the altar represent. The power. It's like the horns, you know, on a, on a, uh, on a powerful beast. Or the altar horns are where you would uh, uh, have certain animals tied there. Sometimes you would have uh, flesh hooks there that would hold some of the animals there. And so you're putting that blood there representing that I identify that the, the, the blood that this animal shed and the death that it's represented can only be amended and, and, and um, corrected by the power of God. And so we're bringing it to the power of God. That's what those horns represent. And it says, and poured out the blood at the bottom of the altar. Right? And then so the remainder of the blood was poured out at the, at the bottom of the altar. And that's where we go. We go to the altar of God. Why? Because that's where that represents the, uh, the place of prayer. When we look at um, uh, the crucifixion and Jesus was on the cross, remember the women and those that were there were, 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 were down below he was he was lifted up because he said if I if I be lifted up I will draw all, draw all men unto me, and those that are down below are looking up to him, and that's what that altar represents that I look up to the Lord. Now we're gonna see this again in the book of Numbers, uh, this whole aspect of looking up, and that's what the altar symbolizes. Uh, we're gonna see that when we get into the fiery serpents, but uh, we're not there yet. So let's keep going. So now verse ten. But the fat and the kidneys and the call above the liver for the sin offering, he burnt on the altar. All right, so now they're following the instructions. Remember, we had all the, those instructions about how to do certain burnt offerings, sin offerings, peace offerings, and now they're following that. Uh, as the Lord had commanded Moses. Verse 11. And the flesh and the hide he burnt with fire without the camp. Remember, we talked about that. There were certain things that you, they didn't burn on the offer, on altar for certain offerings. Now, like the burnt offering that was to the Lord, you burnt everything. But there were other offerings that were, represent, that, that were uh, uh, representative that you, uh, you burnt certain pieces of it, but then other pieces of it you took and you burnt it where? Outside the camp. All right? And so we see them doing that here. So what are they doing here? What we're seeing is they are actually what? Just beginning to do the word of God. They are beginning to obey and follow the instructions. Just like we should do. We should be taking the word of God daily, every day, moment by moment, and following the instructions. Do what God says to do. Well, I don't understand it. That ain't, God didn't tell you to understand it. I want to know what, what, what all that represents and how it all applies, and I want to know the physics and the chemistry behind it. God didn't ask you to learn the chemistry behind the offering. He asked you to do the offering. I want to know the physics. What does it actually do to the psyche of man, and what does it change in the heart?
God didn't ask you to get spiritual about what's happening and to understand psychology. He just said to do what? To do it. Now, as you begin to do it, can God give you some insight as to what it's doing for you and through you? Of course he can. But the key is to do it. Right? And, and watch and see what happens. A lot of times we're trying to, we're trying to understand it because we want to be able to control it. Mm -hmm. See, I want to always be able to say 2 plus 2 equals 4. I know that. I can understand. I got two jelly beans, and if I know if I get two more jelly beans, I will have four jelly beans. And I can do that with anything. I got two pieces of cake. I get two more. I got four. And we can keep doing it. But then you can take two things of God and add two more things of God, and you can end up with 17. Well, that don't make no sense, Wayne. How are you going to get two and two and 17? Well, you talk to Jesus about multiplying that fish. Mm -hmm. right? Amen. You talk to him about that. Right? So he got math and physics and chemistry that we know not of. Amen. Amen. So therefore, it's important just to do what he says. And if he gives you insight, thank God. Oh, I got some insight. I got some understanding. And he may give you insight, but guess what? You may understand it, know it, but then you might open your mouth to try to explain it to somebody and you will not be able to explain it. That's what happened to Paul. Paul, God let Paul experience stuff. And Paul was like, I experienced stuff. He goes, but I can't tell you. It's illegal. It don't make no sense for me to try to explain it because it's not coming out. My words are not bringing out what I, what I understand. And Paul says, I can't even explain it to you. That's, that's the beauty of it, of when it comes down to dealing with the Lord. And, uh, and that's why some people can't believe in God. Because they want to be, if I can't explain it, if I can't break it down into, into simple matter stuff that I can put in a test tube and, and analyze, and, and, well, then you're never going to believe in God if you, if you are relying upon that to be your evidence to trust a God. No, you're not trusting a God. You're trusting your ability to understand. Because now your understanding is still your God. So that still makes who God? You. Mm -hmm. you your, your ability to understand. What God is saying is trust me even when you don't understand. So that's why you could have Moses, you know, saying how am I going to take these millions of people through the wilderness? You can have Abraham who was told to offer up his son. Abraham, I can guarantee you, did not understand that. But yet, he went through it and then watched God work it out. Right? And so we could go on and on and on about the various things that people didn't understand but still did. Because they're following who? They're following the Lord. And so they're, they're, they're bringing these uh, offerings and, and, and they're offering all this up and they say there's certain things that we burn on the altar for certain offerings and certain things we got to take outside the camp, you know, and then we got to burn it outside there. And there's all these different things. You know, well, they don't all seem to kind of make a lot of sense. Some things is, you know, why do we do this one this way and we do the other one the other way? Why don't we do them both the same way? Because God didn't say to do it that way. He told us when you do certain offerings, you burn everything. 
When you do other offerings, you burn certain pieces. The other pieces, you don't even burn them up there. You take it outside the camp and burn it. Other offerings, you burn some of it and you eat, the, you eat some of it. You, know, you, you eat the rest of the meat. And so there's all these variables, but you follow what God has instructed. Now, with that being said, I am so thankful that we live in the time that we can just trust Jesus. We're going through all of this study, and we're looking at all of this stuff that these individuals had to do. But I'm thankful that Jesus came, and he understood every aspect. He knew every piece of how he needed to act and react to be a fulfillment of all that we're studying here. And he is the ultimate offering. He is the peace offering. He is the burnt offering. He is the meat offering. He is the wave offering. He's the heave offering. He's all these offerings. And he did it all. And he is God. And he is God. That's right. All right. Verse 9. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, verse uh, 12 of uh, Leviticus chapter 9. Verse 12. And he slew the burnt offering, and Aaron's sons presented unto him the blood, which he sprinkled round about upon the altar. All right. So now, on some of it, you have to do what? You got to take the blood and you got to sprinkle it, right? You got to you got to allow it to be just kind of throw it in the direction, let it hit whatever it hits, right? So it's, it's some of it is being sprinkled. Why? Because God said so. Thirteen, and they presented the burnt offering unto him with the pieces thereof and the head, and he burnt them upon the altar. Okay, now verse fourteen. And he did wash the inward and the leg and, and burnt them upon uh, the burnt offering on the altar. So remember when we went through the descriptions of the offerings, there were certain things what they had to do that they had to actually wash. Right? And so there's, here's an aspect now where they actually had to do that. So you see all those instructions that were, that were given uh, in the past are now being uh, implemented now. Okay. And he, verse, verse 15, and he brought the people's offering and took the goat. Remember, we talked about the goat, which was the offering for the people, right? Which was the sin offering for the people and slew it, all right? So he slew, that means he's doing what? Another payment of sin. The wages of sin is what? It's death. He slew it and offered it for sin uh, as first. All right, verse 16, and he brought the burnt offering and offered it according to, to the manner. So they're saying that. He, they didn't give us a description like they did before. He just said, we bring the burnt offering and we, we're offering it according to the what? The manner that we normally do it. All right. And so what is that showing now? It's showing that, okay, we now understand that you understand. Because see, when you first tell somebody, when you're first teaching your kids how to make pancakes, you tell them, well, you got to get the flour, you got to get the baking soda, you got to get the salt, you know, you got to get the, the, the water, and you get the pan, put the butter on it. You give them the instructions. And you tell them, okay, now flip it here. But after a while, you don't have to tell them the instructions. You just tell them, go make pancakes. And you have the confidence and know they know what to do. They know how to mix the right amount of ingredients. They know how to utilize the, the, the frying pan and the, and the the oil or the butter. And you know they know how to do it. And you say, just go do it. So now you get, you're telling them to do the exact same thing, but they're using less instruction because you know they know. And uh, so now they're saying, we're going to offer this offering up according to the manner, the way that we're used to doing it. Verse 17. And he brought the meat offering. All right. Remember, that's the, the offering that doesn't have any meat. It's always funny that you know we use that in the King James, but it talks about the grain or the meal offering. So he brought the meat offering and took a handful thereof and burnt it upon the altar beside this, the burnt sacrifice uh, of the morning. All right, Verse 18. He slew also the bullock and the ram for a sacrifice of peace offering. So now that, here's the, the, uh, the uh, description of the peace offering. And see, all these offerings are happening, just like God had instructed them to do, which was for the people. 
And Aaron's son presented unto him the blood which was which he sprinkled upon the altar round about. Verse 19. And the fat of the bullock, and the ram, and the rump, and that which covereth the inwards, and the kidneys, and the caul above the liver. All right? Once again, just this is what you do when you're doing a burnt offering. Verse 20. And they put the fat upon the breast, and, and he burnt the fat upon the altar. All right? That's a little bit uh, uh, different. We're going to see that one here in a minute. Well, why? Look at verse 21. And the breast and the right shoulder, Aaron waved for a wave offering. Oh, remember that? Remember we were introduced to that wave offering and those heaved offerings? Okay. So now they're doing that. So this is a smorgasbord of offerings. All different types of offerings is happening. And why did, why did um, the Lord tell Moses to tell the people to do this? Because what? God says, you do this and I'm going to do what? I'm going to appear to you. See, so they always wanted to, to, to be in the presence of the Lord. And God says, you do these, you, you bring forth all these offerings, and I will appear to you. Well, all of these offerings are incorporated in the, the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. If you do all of these offerings that are in Jesus and accept him, God says, I will appear to you. God will appear to you if you accept the one that fulfilled all this, and that's Jesus. All right? Let's keep going. Um, let me read 21 again. And the breast and the right shoulder Aaron waved for a wave offering before the Lord, and Moses commanded Aaron, lift up his hands towards the people and bless them. All right? So now we've done all of this, and now you're, you're, you're lifting your hands up to the Lord, to, uh, to, towards the people, and you're blessing them. You're saying good uh, uh, things about them and their relationship with God. And come down from an uh, offering of the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offering. So now we can come down. We're done offering all the offerings. Okay? We've done what God told us to do. Verse 23. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle. Okay, they went into the tabernacle. Remember, we talked about the tabernacle, that uh, temporary tent structure that was built where the presence of God would be, where you have the outer court and the holy place and the holy of holies. They went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people. Right? And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. Now we have to just pause there and just stop. So you went through all of this activity and then all of a sudden the glory of the Lord appeared. Why didn't God just show up just say, well, hey, here I am. Why didn't God just go, whoop, here I am. Because that's not how sin is dealt with. And we don't understand the proper aspects about sin. Plus, we don't get the holiness of God. Because if God just appears where there's imperfection, what happens to the imperfection? Burned up. Consumed. It's consumed. consumed. It's burnt up. And so his love protects you. Mm. All this activity is a temporary covering. They're saying, I'm going to do all of this, which I'm going to do myself, because I'm going to cover you through, my, through, the, through the sun. God's going to cover you properly and give to you the proper righteousness that you, that you have to have. But for a temporary uh, a covering, for a ceremonial covering, so that I will appear to you now and you will get a semblance, a, uh, a shadow of what shall be, I'm going to appear to you. But before I do, I need these temporary coverings for you to put on. Okay, so now you say, well, it's like if you go go into the sea and you go go uh, uh, underwater. Those people that go underwater and they put those uh, oxygen tanks on them, they're doing what? Scuba diving. Now, 
you got to do a lot of little preparation. There's certain things of knowing how to put weights on, and you got to know how fast to go. Because if you go if you go down too fast, the pressure, you got a lot of pressure to build up what slowly. Otherwise, you're going to get what's called the bends, and you get, you get oxygen built up in your blood, and, and you, people, it's very painful. And some people can die from that. Even when you come up, you got to come up at a right uh, time, and, and, and you got to know how to do it. Why? Because you're going into an, an environment that if you don't do these things, that environment will kill you. You'll go into that water without your oxygen tank. You don't follow the instructions on how to understand how to uh, allow the weights to bring you down at a certain descent at a proper time. If you go down too fast or if you come up too fast, your blood will, will get oxygen in it and it can kill you or be very painful. Because you're dealing with something that if you don't prepare properly, will kill you. Well, that's what righteousness and perfection we are in perfection. And if we don't put on a, a covering of perfection so that we can be like that which covers us, which is God, it will consume us. And so the love of God, while we were yet, what? Sinners. Sinners. God Sinners. loved us. We're not prepared to be in his presence at all. We don't got no spiritual scuba diving equipment on at all. And God covers us and tells us to put it on. Here it is. Now, back in the day, they had to do all of this and God would appear. But then it was only for a certain period and for a certain time. And you had to make sure you go properly into the tabernacle and only do it certain uh, ways and different things. When Jesus died, that veil and the temple was what? Rent. It was torn. So now the scripture says we can go to God how? Boldly. 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 To the throne of grace. We still have to have a covering. All right. And so, and, and why? Because the Lord has what? Changed us. We are different now. All right. So now we, we've been what? Born again. Okay. Let me make another very weird analogy. Suppose there was a way for you to get born again to where you could breathe both air and water. But not until you get born again. If you're not born again, you got to put on the scuba diving equipment. But if you get born again, you can breathe the air and you can dive into the water. You can go swim just like a shark, up and down, whatever you want to do. No problem. But if you don't get born again, you can't do that. Well, I'm using that as a very crude analogy when it comes down to dealing in the spiritual realm where God lives. If you want to be spiritual and you want to go into the spiritual realm and you want to deal with and, and be in the presence of God, you need to be born again. You got to be changed. Your spirit man has to be changed so that you can have the holiness. And that's what God, see, we, you know, we, when we do the analogy of water, we know what it is. It's that water, and you're not getting that. Well, what will kill you in the spiritual realm is holiness. See, if you don't have holiness, if you don't have the proper righteousness before God, because God will never be unperfect. God will never have a blemish. So if anything is there that is not covered in righteousness, it is consumed. That's why Jesus told the story about the man that came to the wedding and didn't have the proper what? Wedding garment on. And he's sitting up there not covered in the proper uh, situation. Like how... If we try to go before God, not covered in the proper righteousness of Jesus. And Jesus told uh, in the uh, story, he said, take that man that don't have the proper wedding garment on, bind him hand and foot, cast him into outer darkness. Where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. So if we don't have the righteousness of Jesus, we are not going to have an eternal uh, uh, peace or eternal joy. All right? So that's the important aspect. And that's where, when we look at verse 23 here, that in part, where it says, and bless the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Not will appear, not shall appear, appeared. He was there unto all the people. So now, 
Everybody saw it. Why? Because everybody was ready. Why? Because everybody did the proper instructions. So if we all did what was according to the word of God, we'd all be all right. But we're not all going to do it. We all got our own opinions. That's why we all are different. We all got different philosophies about how we should and or what we shouldn't do. Our final verse. And there came fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw it, they shouted and th fell on their faces. Now look at that. Okay, so that offering was representative of the people. See, if you didn't have the offering, when God appeared, where would that fire go? I'm surmising, and I'm kind of putting, you know, a, a, a probable cause, but you'd be consumed. But instead of the people being consumed, what was consumed? The offerings that they presented to the Lord. They were consumed. All right? And when the people saw that, I want it. And here's the other thing. We're going to finish with this. Everybody went, oh, I just want to see God. I want to see God. Well, want... Yeah, and, and, and me too. Me too. I do too. But when you see him, when you're in his presence, you're not going to be jumping for joy and, and, and woo, hey, what's up? High five. And you're going to do just what they did here. You're going to, you're going to fall on your face. You're going to have a sense of Wow. Just like every other person in the Bible that had any glimpse of the presence of God, the one thing they recognized is how awesome God is and how low their state is. And therefore, they fell on their face because they could not even stand to be in the presence of the Lord and look upon what he was presenting their immediate reaction is, I got to go down. The scripture says, every knee shall bow mm -hmm. and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. All right. So we're going to stop there. You did good. Any other comments or questions?